Jacob. Yeah, and we'd like to first of all acknowledge that we're on Bangaran country at the moment. Um, we're lucky enough to live on and be supported by Bangaran country, and we're very grateful to the Bangaran pe- people for their enduring custodianship. Um, so I'll let you talk about where you're coming from, Jacob, but this is our third Bake the World a Better Place chat. Um, where basically we just wanted to uh, share conversations with um, our friends and peers that are in the kind of local grains space um, so that we can share each other's experiences and I guess, um, you know, gain momentum as we're working towards building a, a local grain economy. And our understanding of a local grain economy is where grain is kind of appreciated and celebrated for its its diversity, um, its regionality and its potential for landscape and cultural change. And I guess underpinning that um, is the need to support First Nations food and land sovereignty. Um, and, you know, obviously grains and grasses, are, you know, play a huge role in the uh, cultural and ecological um, story for First Nations people. So we're yeah super privileged to have Jacob here to kind of talk about um, his experience in the native grains space. Jade um, from Black Barn Farm and Sustainable Table connected us, um, and we've also got mutual friends with Rob Pekin and um, and Chris. So we're yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, but if you have, if you can introduce um, what country you're on tonight, where you're from, and how you got into native grains, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah, no, no worries. Inga Jacob, inga Gumalore, na when nangale na kabi kabi undambi. I just um, acknowledge the undambi of the kabi kabi nation whose country I'm on at the moment, down um, southern end of Sunshine Coast, Queensland. So um, I guess I got into native grains through, um, oh, I don't know how far you want to go back, really. You can go back like a thousand generations if you want, but no, more recently, like... Um, doing honours research at Southern Cross Uni. So I looked right. at the nutritional profiles um, of seven of our important species from like all across Australia because I wanted to sort of represent every kind of region of Australia. So anywhere in the country you could identify one of these species that grow could grow in your backyard kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, it's just sort of snowboard from there yeah right and so wh- what have you been doing more recently in, um in this space yeah uh just kind of finished writing up the um native grain strategic rdne plan so uh agri futures will publish this um strategic strategic RDE plan in uh, hopefully November so that right. other stakeholders in this um, process it's a collaborative author authorship um, the other stakeholders holding it at the moment just adding their um, notes and comments and content and then you know we'll have that back to AgriFutures and that should be out by November so yeah keep your eyes peeled for that um, it'll be published on the AgriFutures website I would imagine um, and that's detailing like a 10 year plan to grow this industry and hopefully seeing it led by First Nations people, uh, governed by First Nations and equitable benefits going back to First Nations people. But it's an industry for everybody that everybody can feel a part of. Um, and uh, also sort of working towards, you know, setting up some kind of entity to to like help pick up this roadmap. So the risk is with a with a strategic plan, 
who's going to like you publish it and the risk is it just sits on a shelf and gathers dust because who's going to pick it up and run with it mm. so it's also seeing that gap and saying well we need to set up some kind of entity that can help drive this industry in the way it needs to be driven right. so yeah it's in so the process of happening that's the next big challenge yeah is it's a challenge yeah what, what that is right <laughs> yeah. nothing, it's, nothing. it's a pretty big it's a big vision um you know like yeah well i i get like really like big vision kind of thinking and yeah you, you uh, come back down to earth sometimes and but you've got, got a really good group of people around me and and like a co-founder who i'm working with so yeah and so what have been, as you've been working in this area and, and then also working on the, the roadmap, what have you identified to be the main challenges? Well, should we just go back oh. a little bit and say, <laughs> what is the big vision like in the, of the 10 year yeah. roadmap? Perhaps that sounds like an interesting place to start. Um. This is my 10 year vision. So I'm a Queenslander and, um, you know, in Southwest Queensland in particular, we have like, you know, that's, that's the grassland country and New South Wales as well. Like that's that country that like Sturt and Mitchell saw like piled heaps of grasses where they were collecting the grain, all those like thousands of acres of like cut, um, Panicum, that was all out in that like Gamolaroi and Whale Winning Ember, like uh, right down to Barfinji up to like Kuma country. Um, so, my big vision is seeing like all those grassland um, nations getting back into that economy. And I would love to see like in 10 years is to have like we got the Olympics in Brisbane in 10 years, 2032. I would love to see like Queensland grains on the menu at the Brisbane Olympics. That's Made amazing. Grains from Queensland, and not just not just there, but you know, like stories in the Qantas magazine flying over to Australia, <laughs> and like you know, pop up sort of stuff all around Brisbane city, and um, you know, promoting those stories and and with with getting all those regions back into that traditional economy um, then there's an opportunity to develop like these like cultural food trails so each group's got its own language and its own story and its own type of ecology and um, within their within their like um, grassland ecosystem different types of grains so there's an opportunity then to promote that to all these tourists who are coming over like go and go out west and have a tour with the local mob and and like grow that tourism as well and and having like these stone mills in every regional town so each community is like owning its own story um grinding their own grain making bread selling it to the tourists feeding their own people so it's part of food security as well um yeah that's kind of like the 10-year vision so that's why, that's why we, that's why I'm like, yeah, I need to set something up to start because 10 years will go quick. Yeah. So yeah, you, you're wanting to set something up that's um, very much has like on the ground, like real outcomes, but is broad enough that other communities can kind of use it as a resource as well. Is that what I'm understanding? Sorry, the... Like the, the kind of platform that you're wanting to establish to then, um, you know, branch out from and, and create this kind of on the ground change. Mm. It, it has like these real local localized outcomes, but it sounds like you're also trying to create a platform that's a, that's a national platform as well that other 
um, community groups can kind of can tap into as a resource as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Look, you, you like I see this. Like I see like supporting communities to get into it, but at the end of the day, they they lead and run their own enterprise. Yeah. So, right. Um. Yeah, it's not trying to set up a Gamilaroi entity and then trying to own it on Kuma country or, yeah. or like Mythica country or Mardigan or that kind of thing. You, you want them to own their own. That's part of their self-determination and economic independence story um, is, is them running that themselves. You just, you just help facilitate to make that happen um, mm -hmm. through whatever support that you can provide. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like it, it also is broad enough. I want to see it broad enough that we can actually take it internationally as well, because like, you know, we share a lot of species with countries like all, all the way across that um, Southeast Asia, right into Africa. It's like, it's like the grasses followed where the people went and and who knows, like, maybe the people came from here and went to Africa. That's what that's what Aboriginal people would say anyway, is we came out of Australia into Africa. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist or a, um, yeah. I guess regardless, yeah. people and the plan, you know, like there's all. Yeah, it, but we can, we could like make it even broader and, and if we can prove the model here in Australia, localised food processing, like around that fundamental food, like we're not talking about some kind of condiment that you put on your bread, like a bush tomato jam that you put on your bread. We're talking about the bread itself. That's, that's what feeds 8 billion people is the cereals in this, on this planet we if we didn't have cereals, there wouldn't be 8 billion people. So that's what feeds people. Um, and if you're like putting these things in each little community, growing local grains, like that's, that's really powerful for like food security. And if you take it to places in say, like Africa where they have similar like food insecurity issues and, and drought like we experience, and you're putting like perennial grasses in the ground because our natives are perennial, then they persist through drought um, and they hold that soil together and they provide biodiversity and um, you know like we we have we grow say wheat in Australia and in drought you can't grow anything so you just got bare barren earth and that's just like a solar panel it's just just like baking the ground you know, like you see those studies where they you don't even have to do a scientific study. You just buy a heat gun and go measure the temperature coming off bare soil and then yeah. measure, like, cut grass and then measure a tussock of grass and look at the difference. It's dramatic. So mm -hmm. you, you keep and We wonder why we have all these big heat waves. It's like we've got a big solar panel out there of barren earth. So it's like, let's, let's cover it with perennial grasses. But anyway... Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's why we became interested in native grasses is because of the, you know, from an environmental point of view, the um, their conservation value and their ecology, like their potential for kind of regenerating yeah. landscapes. Is that what, like, what brought you to native grasses? Did you come from a kind of a cultural background? Is that how you were introduced to it and became interested in it, or was it from a more conservation kind of um, angle, or is it more complicated than that? Um, oh, I actually got into like uh, as a kid, like my parents had me out in the garden all the time, like helping them with gardening stuff. So introduced at a really young age, but then sort of forgot about it as like a teenager and young adult but then got into permaculture yeah right. like my, my mid to late 20s I got into like permaculture and I was kept asking like 
you know, we can grow this kind of, we can do permaculture, but how do we, again, it's that thing about like, how do you do permaculture with like cereals? Because like cereals, you got to kind of till the earth every year. That's kind of, um, you know, intensive and a, a bit destructive in somewhere like Australia. It's okay for like say Europe or whatever, but our soils just don't handle it. Um, so it's like, uh, but then I got into, did like the undergrad in environmental science and learned about land degradation and um, just learning about how many millions of hectares we have already lost to salinity and that we have forecast to lose. Like if you look at the figures of how much land we're going to lose to salinity by 2050, it's staggering. It's like millions and millions of hectares of land will get lost to salinity. And I was like looking at kangaroo grass growing on the headlands and in the sand dunes. And it's like, why don't we put kangaroo grass out on the salt affected regions and remediate the soil? Mm. And, that, and, and then from there, I was like, started looking into grasses and the whole keystone function they play in the ecosystem. Like they're the keystone species, like grasses. We're such a grassland country. Like we... Oh, there's one place here on the sunny coast where there was like a nice, just the only one left where there was a nice sward of kangaroo grass. Kangaroo grass is really that keystone species in Australia. Um, and I went and checked it out yesterday and it, it's just been overgrown with woody weeds and, and the eucalypts are coming in now. And, um, you know, we, we keep talking about like we need to plant more trees or whatever, but I think the opposite is true. I think we need to take trees out and put grasslands in because that's, that's what our ecology wants. Um, I can just see like all of these eucalypts just becoming like a, like unmanaged, like hectares and hectares of unmanaged eucalypts growing like this far apart from each other. It's mm -hmm. just a fire trap and it doesn't have any ecological value because yeah. they're too too close together, like eucalypts need to spread their canopy to, so they can drop limbs and provide hollows for all our hollow dwelling species, like all the birds that nest in hollows, goannas nest in hollows, bats and possums and all this kind of stuff. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I probably and... got into it from that, yeah, conservation yeah. side and then got into the cultural side. Um, yeah, it all just sort of clicked. Yeah. So many of the things that can all benefit. Um, yeah. And what are you most excited about? So, like, I know you've shared your your vision for ten years. What What are you like, kind of, on the ground at the moment, seeing as like the main opportunities in terms of research and. Um, I mean, I know we talked earlier today when we were kind of um, chatting about what we were going to talk about tonight. We were talking about technology um, being a big opportunity. Can you talk maybe a bit about that? Or, or, or what do you see as like the kind of next opportunity in terms of research and, and furthering this um, emerging industry, I guess? Yeah. Um, I think just having a really a much greater understanding of our native grasses, like all round, um, from ecology to agronomy. So knowing how to, how to actually grow them and particularly somewhere like here on the sunny coast, which is subtropical. And, and like I was saying, the last little remnant of kangaroo grass is now being overrun with woody weeds. Um, where you do have grasses, it's all like invasive pest species like green panic and that wild sorghum and um, cooler Thai grass and all these other real wild kind of things that just choke everything out. And so it's like, how do you, how do you bring back a native grass when I mean, you got to contend with all that kind of stuff um, yeah. in a place like, like sunny coast? But um, then there's like other things like uh, the threshing is a really big roadblock at the moment. Um, 
So it's like we're removing the grain from the husk um, where say something like wheat has been bred over 10,000 years um, to make it really easy to remove that grain out of the husk. And we've actually got like um, things like the combine header, which will do it all in one process. But, you know, like I was saying today, it, if we if we didn't have the combine header, growing wheat would be non-viable. Like the, the labour um, required to, to actually thresh the grain and do the, all the winnowing work and all that kind of stuff wouldn't be viable. So all we've got to do in Australia is like, because Australian actually invented the combine header. So all we need is another Australian to invent the next iteration of the combine, which can deal with native grains. Um, so it's a, it's a really big opportunity, but um, it's also kind of what's protecting First Nations interests in the space at the moment, because we do have this roadblock. So it's kind of protected us in a way from it just kind of becoming this like a industry that just runs away on it on us, mm. like every other kind of bush food industry in Australia. Um, yeah, so it would you would hope that whoever does develop this does it in partnership with say you know one of the leading entities in this space um, okay. yeah but this is a, it's a big opportunity and i think just just being able to like have have perennial grasses in the ground and, and getting like edible grain off them and, and just it's pretty good, like, yields, considering there's no inputs. So I just mm -hmm. think that's exciting. Like, that would, that would fundamentally change agriculture to tip it on its head. Yeah. If you're, you're not tilling the earth and putting wheat in and chucking all this fertiliser on it and all this pesticide on it, and if you're just letting something that wants to grow um, provide your food and it's doing all those other things, like, that's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess that brings us to kind of like our last question. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to like draw attention to what you were saying about just like getting that kind of agronomy right. Because like, it, yeah, the plant itself does have, so, have, it has so much potential in that it's perennial and it does, it's, you know, quite low input. But getting a stand of native grasses established from you know pretty degraded landscape is yeah that's a huge challenge like because I feel like from our work in the kind of conservation um, world it's all very like herbicide heavy and um, you know it's super like there's a lot of interventions that kind of go against our approach to farming that happens in in conservation to get native grasses established which is kind of um yeah i mean it's 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 a problematic um approach so i think what you're saying about yeah just figuring out how to establish the native grasses in a an efficient and holistic way is, is super important so that we are not just like kind of coming at it in the same kind of warfare heavy um, approach that I think some of the conservation base is at, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it'll be like going for those, those low hanging fruit too. Um, before we try to tackle the heavy, the harder stuff like, you know, what what you're sort of talking about, like going for the ones where it's not going to be as difficult to grow it. Yeah. Or there's going to be a bit more, uh, say, a bit more agronomic knowledge on that species. Um, yeah, because there are definitely some easier targets and then there are some other really quite tricky ones. So. Yeah will be going for the proving proving the model proving that it can work and then expanding it to 
in, include your other species and other habitats. So, so where you are, you're like it's probably probably a bit higher rainfall. I'm guessing. I don't know. Would you call yourself semi-arid? Oh uh, no, nah, not. So. Yeah, so you go for the semi-arid rangelands will be where you start because that's going to be the easiest. To... Yeah, I mean, a lot of places there are there's already established um, lands stands. that are just being used as sheep feed, and if they can be transformed to be, if there's a way to support people by taking the grain rather than having an animal on it with that. That's awesome. Mm. And you can um you can actually take the grain and um sustainably graze it as well. Yeah. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. But it's not <laughs> it, it's not set stocking but you can't do that. They'll just they'll just um you know that's the problem that we've face now is the set stocking dilemma but um yeah and that's that you know in out in the rangelands that doesn't work for everybody but i think these are just sort of hurdles that we can jump figure out how to do it so to finish off so we can let you get back to your evening um i guess we've had a few people ask what can eaters do to kind of support this emerging industry? And and I guess a related but separate question is what can, how can farmers kind of position themselves as allies um, to support the work that you and, and a lot of other groups and communities are, are doing in this space? Yeah. Um... So this is that's a tricky one because that's the same question I always get is like how do people want to support it, um, yeah, and or or get involved and again I, that's kind of like one of the purposes of this entity is to to provide that like I was saying that 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 bridge between the two, um, trying to. Like facilitate some kind of um, way that landholders or, or food industry or agriculture industry people can can come into the space um, in a way that's kind of governed by like this like a First Nations kind of entity. Um, yeah, we had a had a big yarn around this topic today, and we probably haven't got super amounts of time to delve into it um, but yeah I, I I don't know how you support it because in in the right way in the really authentic way uh, because um, you know there there are people already doing selling stuff but it's not authentic um, and how do you even how do you even differentiate? Like, how does the consumer even differentiate between the authentic and the non-authentic? It's just I don't know. Um, but like, yeah, I think yeah, it's a big question. Yeah, no. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how we can. We still got so far to go in Australia yeah. with like. Like any any First Nations people that put their hand up and and try to be like a like a beacon in community, once they do that, all of a sudden are pulled in every direction because everybody wants to engage. Yeah. Um. And but we need to be able to to like determine our own futures first and and have a bit of like um sort of self-determination and just get ourselves established um, a bit of economic independence before we yeah and, and get get ourselves centered and, and and established somewhere where then we can go out and and support everybody else to get into it um, 
Yeah, but it, even even without that, I, I try to. I, I think everybody should be a part of this, and everybody could be growing their own native grains and, and eating them. I just say as long as you aren't trying to commercialise it and say you had a group of farmers in a region who started to, you know, they all had a had a bit of native grass here and there and combined that's actually, oh, they say to each other, oh, we've actually got quite a lot here. Um, I would say maybe have the initiative and, and maybe try to reach out to some someone in your local community, like a um, First Nations people in the local community to say like, you know, we've, we've got this product here. Um, there's potential to do something with it. We don't want to profit off it. We just want to sort of, you know, come together and have a feed. Um, would you like to be a part of that? We're not trying to profiteer off it. We just have this resource and we want to participate and that kind of thing I could see happening. Um, yeah, but I'd really like to see like this, like a national entity, um, you know, and, and maybe like regional clusters all around Australia where um, people could engage through those entities, um, and those entities then could then like identify the people in the community who who could be um, you could sort of connect people with. Yeah, uh, it, it's something <clears throat> to sort of work on and figure out as we go. It is a tricky one because it always comes down to like, like First Nations people would really just love to have a bit of land back. <laughs> really, really, like native title is really, um, it's weak. And I was saying today on the phone, like, Native title can't extinguish freehold. Um, so, you know, it, up in Northern Territory, they've got a lot of land, but, you know, in the, in the grassland country, rangeland country, not many people actually do. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you sort of still need a bit of space to, to you know, get ourselves back on track because you know the that gap between indigenous and non-indigenous is not narrowing it's getting wider so things aren't improving in a lot of cases you know like children getting incarcerated it's just nuts so yeah, yeah. big yeah. question for a, for a wednesday night <laughs> i'm Kind sorry. of a rabbit hole no, no, but it's, it's I think, good. I don't know, I think what I've taken from this chat and from our chat earlier today, though, and it's something that we've been thinking about a lot, is that allies need to kind of understand that this is a really complex and long, long-term kind of, I don't know, journey might not be the right word, but um, process that's kind of yeah. unfold. I guess um, if I don't know, I just think it, like and generosity and and space is just something that allies can um, take on board at this stage, maybe. Yeah, and and I'd say you know if you want to do something tomorrow, is just plant plant a native grass or or get something a native um yeah probably grass native grass and start trying to grow it at home i don't know like i i got i live in a sardine tin really like i got barely anything <laughs> you could jump from roof to roof where i live but still like chucked in barbed wire grass and it just it is so prolific and hardy like you've got to all you can fit in the backyard is like a trampoline and and it's literally like growing on the trampoline like in thin air it is <laughs> it's just <laughs> surviving off the moisture in the air there's this um you know just just um 
conserving the genetics because we, like I was saying, um, where I live, you'd be really um, hard pressed to find a like a tussock of kangaroo grass or tussock of weeping grass or something like it's all non-native stuff a, a lot of ceteria as well ceteria is like this invasive thing as well so something you could do is like just start conserving your local um genetics with grasses and when we publish this um this roadmap like you'll see some of the priority species in there so like go for some of those priority species and just just try to conserve the genetics in your local region and um, for like graziers and that like have conversations with other graziers and see um, you know, is there certain practices that promote the regeneration of native grasses so I've heard a lot of um, regenerative grazers say that um, those practices actually help native grasses come back so it's, it's kind of like, um, kind of I see kind of like using cattle, like like for fire, and in cultural fire will never be replicated. It, it's so subtle and um, perfectly suited to our ecology, um, but you could use cattle similarly. Like you, you're just clearing away the rubbish to let the natives regenerate, uh, but you're not hitting it too hard that you degrade it. Because um, cattle love our native grasses and, and sheep and cattle and all that, and then they'll just eat it, eat it, eat it until it's, you know, and all the weeds will just come through. Um, yeah. But I forget what I was saying. No, that's really good advice. Like about, yeah, just getting to know these species and um, appreciating them and, them, yeah. 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 Um, but we'll yeah, and, and that yeah, that's it too. I was gonna say like it is. We are on a on an intergenerational journey with this, so yeah. we're not even envisioning that it'll be achieved in our lifetime. It's something you're gonna have to we're, we're trying to look generations into the future. Um, so it, we just do need need that patience and um yeah honestly and this is this is like this will sound terrible but you also need capital yeah. any, any philanthropic funders out there that that's what we need is like you know we, we're trying to do something that's going to flip agriculture like specifically broad acre cropping on its head but we, we can't just do that on like goodwill um, you know, need to put food on the table, need to be able to dedicate energy into it. So yeah, it'll sound selfish, but like at the end of the day, like okay. you, you need, you need capital and um, yeah, really, you need really good governance and, and leadership. You need capital and you need land and that'll, that's like the dream. That's the wish list. Yeah. yeah. And I think something that was, we're like we're well over time, but um, something that you talked about today that was interesting too is that like trying to do this work in a way that doesn't burn you out as well because it's so there's like so many roadblocks, um, mm. like today, and it's so long term and it's intergenerational and it's so complex and there are like a lot of social and cultural factors at play. So you have the, you have your land and your capital and your leadership, but you also need to like be doing this work in a sustainable fashion that doesn't leave you depressed in the gutter crying. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, like don't know how, yeah, I think it's a, it's a big um, problem for, a lot of people working in kind of um, in activism or in, in, in the social kind of welfare space. Like how do we do this work without um, running ourselves too thin? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a 
it's yeah, it's really common. Burnout. Yeah. 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 Go to look after your mental health. Yeah. And on that note, we should get back to your family. <laughs> So you're not that beacon that everyone's uh, trying to talk to and um, yeah, get to I, I definitely am not that. <laughs> yeah. I would appreciate the conversation and the and those people who stuck around to hear us having a yarn. Yeah. Well, I'll thank just... you. I'll just run through and see what, if anyone said. Oh, Chris said that maybe allies need to wait for the invitation. That's a good point. Um, an exciting vision. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I think that was no questions. Um, awesome. All right, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. No, thank you for having me. Have a good night. You too. See you.